<laughs> Hack Reactor pants, they're, they're, they're on row. Uh, okay, so what I want to do before I get into scopes and closures is just give you the briefest tour of some of the rules of what, how, how it works inside a function. So when we're defining a function, and remember this area here is the region I want you not to confuse with properties of the function. From this curly brace to this curly brace, that's where we put the lines of code that should only run when we invoke the function. But it has nothing to do with properties, so check this out. I might want to pass something into a function. A function is something that does work depending on some, some uh, input. And that's where we put, that's where we give names to whatever gets passed in. If this was a blender, that would say whatever fruit they want to blend, right? But instead I'm just calling it input. And then we would do some work on that input. So I can make it all uppercase and then log it out. Notice the yellow code does not run until, in this case, it won't run at all. And here it will run in between logging example one and example two. So the question is, what can we pass in there? Well, I can tell from the code here that it's expecting a string, so I might pass in a string. And down here we have a real value. Up here we just have a name for anything that gets passed into the function. Here's where I want you not to be confused. What do we expect this to log uh, in the pick? That's right. I wish this was high. Whatever is in input, so that I don't think we know what it is. You don't think we know what input is. So input is up here. So what would you expect to show up on the screen as a result of this log line? The if, yeah. What is it? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. All right. Well, the word input here seems to be a variable lookup. And a lot of people would like to think that this means we're going to be talking about whatever was passed in as input here. But because of scopes, the, va the variables available in between these two curly braces are not available outside of these two curly braces. So, this is not going to work at all. Because there is no variable input out here in the global scope. Can anybody think of a fix for that? Some way that we can log the input. Think of what you might type down here to, yeah. Um, we would call, uh, we would want the function to return log. You would rewrite the function so that it returns its input? Yes. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Here's what a lot of people propose. They say, well, we'll use dot access on the function object. And this is that thing that I was trying to repeat. There is no overlap between the stuff in between these curly braces and the idea of properties on a function object. So using dot access is just kind of grabbing at a tool and being like, maybe I can use this to get access to it. The answer is no, you can't get access to input from outside these two curly braces under any circumstances. Because scoping rules are there to help you. You're not allowed to break those scoping rules using some other mechanism like dot access. Especially considering dot access talks about properties and scopes have to do with function bodies and there is no overlap between the two. two the two concepts <coughs> are never thought about using the same mechanisms. It doesn't also work to use brackets for the same reasons. Uh, and this stuff we can kind of skip past because it's less related to scopes and closures. Uh, but, if we have a function fun that returns to, I'm going to put some extra white space in here. This is pretty equivalent to if I was to use this function, if I was simply to type it out again in place of the variable name that stores that function. So here I now have 
not one but two different functions that do the same thing. And the second one, notice, I am just invoking immediately. This is called an immediate invocation. It's not too useful right here. I might as well have just said var 2 equals 2. Why would I have all of that other stuff there? It's useful in other circumstances we'll, we'll see in a minute. What I wanted to make clear was that saying fun paren paren, right, this construct is almost exactly equivalent to this construct. Just typing a whole function out and invoking it immediately. There's very little difference. Two parens means invoke whatever's to my left. Yeah? So these two parens right here are going to invoke the function on their left. Just like these two parens right here are going to invoke the function referred to by fun on the left. That's a really tricky concept for some people. Have any questions? Yeah. Is there a way you can't the string like you did before? It, yes, it makes it smaller. But let's see what we can do. Uh, TH, could you help me by getting four chairs and lofting this up on four chairs? Okay, so for now it's just a little smaller, but it's at least high enough to read it. No problem. So, is there any two more people to hold it up while the other people put the chairs in? Not all speakers get TAs. <laughs> Most speakers just have to go over there and do it themselves in the middle of the talk. Not funny, never mind. So it would be kind of odd to do so, but you could imagine doing so in other circumstances. 
If we were to edit the rest of this function too, then it would make sense to start passing things in here. Can you also use it to invoke other functions? Invoke other functions. These parens can only invoke the function immediately on their left. So we can only invoke this function right here, but we can use other parens to invoke other functions. Get one more question about the two parens, the ambiguity between them, etc. Can you yeah. pass a uh, parameter to the first paren? Could I pass something in here? If I were to put something in between here, it would not be passing anything, it would be giving names to things that were passed in. Because if you look up here, this is where I give names to the inputs to this function, right? Does that, does that look familiar? These parens are where I give names to things being passed in. Zooming back momentarily, I give names like input to whatever gets passed in. Same is true here, I give names to whatever is passed in. Same is true here, this is just where I give names to the inputs to a function. Great question. Yeah, we had a question. Yeah. Can you return a function and then go back by putting another set of parentheses on the right? You're absolutely right. If we, made, if we made this thing return itself, if we made this function return itself, we could put any number of parens after it we wanted. It's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to do that in the console. You guys up for that? Yes. Var <laughs> foo is a function. Turn, turns food. Right? So when I call foo, what do I get? I get foo. When I call foo and then call a result, I'm calling foo. So I can just do this all day. That's kind of cool. Okay. So, up above here, I could, of course, immediately invoke the function, but then this variable would be named poorly, because it's no longer storing a function. What is it storing? You there. What is this variable, this misnamed variable, now storing? It's storing two now? It is yeah, storing two. Going back here, this variable was named two because it stores the return value. So when we put parens here, this should be named two as well. Because the result of this entire expression, which is a function definition followed by an immediate invocation, the result of the entire expression is two. And so this should be named something two like, like duo. But now, down below, this code here doesn't make any sense because the, the parens that were there before don't make any sense. You cannot call the number two. All right, this last part, I'm just going to give you a hint because we're not going to use this feature too much. You can refer to inputs using the arguments object. Arguments just keeps an up-to-date list of the, of the arguments that got passed in. An argument to a function is very much like a variable, a local variable within the function, with the exception that this doesn't have a value right now. You need to assign whatever the first input was. So this is an array-like object that refers to the first, that, that has a list of the arguments in it, including the first one here, which would make this work. This whole thing is equivalent to that whole thing. Any questions about that? Yeah. So in that case, the argument is like a reserve. The reserve, yeah, arguments is a reserve keyword that reflect whatever was passed into the function the word arguments appears within. All right. If there are any more questions, I'd be happy to 
answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to tell you about scopes and closures. Cool. So a scope. What do you think of when you hear the word scope? What, what is your working definition of scope when you just like hear? Um, whatever variables I have. For whatever variables we have access to. Yep. Very useful working definition. Any other things you think of? Any other like ways that you think about the word scope? Objects come in the scope and create So I'm hearing a lot about access. Areas of our code where we can talk about variables. There are actually two definitions of the word scope. Uh, and they map approximately to the idea of lexical scoping and dynamic scoping. But there are basically two ways in which people use the word scope. One way that they use the word scope is to talk about the regions of your typed code that have distinct access rules from the other regions. So while I'm typing in this section between these curly braces, I can talk about variable A, B, and C, when I'm typing in these curly braces over here, I can talk about variables x, y, z, and they won't generate errors. But if I talk about x over here, then I will generate an error. Or if I talk about a over here, I will generate an error. Does that make sense? That's one way that people use the word scopes. Another valid use of the word scopes is the data structure that is generated at runtime to store those variables. So one was the area of your code you can type in, and the other is this runtime data store. Those are very different, and here's why. A runtime data store, there will be many instances of a runtime data store for every region of the code. For every distinct scope region in your code, you could imagine there being many data store is generated because you're going to run that function many times. A scope is generated by a function in JavaScript. So let's take a look at the data store version and I'll show you how it maps to the code in a moment. Here we have a visual representation of a region, uh, like a, a fenced in area where we're storing a collection of values. Those values have labels on them. Variable names. Bunch of key value pairs. Does this remind you of anything? What does that reminisce of? Uh, objects. It feels very similar to objects. You've got a collection of values, they have keys in them, there's some namespacing, so they can be collected in one, and then there's other scopes elsewhere. How are they different? How are scopes and variables different? What well, are scopes and objects different? One of the most interesting is the way you access them. This is probably the most relevant thing. You access a uh, variable using an identifier. You say log the temperature. Temperature does a variable lookup. It looks it up in a scope. There are rules for how you can what what identifiers you can talk about and which ones you can't. Those are scoping rules. When you want a property off of an object, you, you need to use a dot. So dot age. Notice we had to use variable lookup to do the user, to find the user object in the first place. But once we had a user object, we were able to use dot age. I'm going to change the slide right now because I can make this even clearer. Maybe that's clear, maybe not. In this example, I never even did any variable lookups. I just accessed the age property with a dot. So up here we have a, an identifier lookup on a variable, and it does all, it interacts with all of the scoping rules. And here we have dot access, which interacts with all of the object access rules. These two worlds are very similar. They have similar rules, but they have no way of interacting. Right? 
it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like um, two different planets in two different solar systems in two different universes, where all the laws of physics are the same. So the laws governing key value access are pretty similar here as they are here, but you will never be able to interact. There will be no interaction between these worlds, even though the rules governing the two worlds are very similar. And people get this confused. They try to access properties just by talking about their, their, their key as if it was a variable name. Or they try to do dot access on a function's local variables. In that example, fun.input, remember how I said people want to type fun.input? That's trying to use property access, which looks similar but lives in a different universe, in order to get access to local variables. Okay. Is it a bad thing to access, to try and access the local variables of a function using a dot? It's bad in as much as your code won't run. But other than that, it's fine. <laughs> uh, no, it's not bad. It just doesn't work. So this hopefully can do some of the work of making clear the difference between a scope and, a, and an object. Specifically, the fact that you can't get a reference to a scope. So my first function is called give me an object. Give me object returns an object that has x, y, and z as property, as keys, right? It returns that object immediately. So someone calling give me an object could operate on it. They could iterate across that object, name all of the keys there. They could mutate it. They could add one to it. They could do anything you can do to an object. In the second example, give me a scope, we create local variables A, B, and C. And I ask the question, what could you return such that someone calling give me scope would then be able to operate on the scope? They would then be able to edit the scope, insert new variables, iterate across the variables to find out which ones were present. The answer is there is no such construct in JavaScript. There is no way to get access to that scope. This is exactly how distinct the two universes are. The universe of scopes, although there are runtime scopes being generated all the time, and they have these key value pairs, kind of like properties on an object, they are in such a different universe that you can't even get references to these scope collections. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? They are like objects that are useful for storing collections of things, but you don't get direct access to them. What is the only way you can interact with a scope and modify a scope and interact with it at all? Uh, in the green shirt with the sunglasses. What's the only way you can think of interacting with a scope? The data contained by a scope, let's say. What's that? Uh, you can't use dot notation. Good guess. Dot notation is how you get access to, dot and bracket notation are equivalent, and it's how you get access to properties on an object. But a scope stores variables and does not give you any mechanism for, t for getting a reference to the scope. And so the only way you can interact with the data in a scope, or a scope at all, is to talk about its variables. You use variable access. You talk about an identifier and you assign to it, or you access it and then console log that or something. By talking, about, by talking about an identifier from within the lines of code that you're allowed to, you're interacting with the runtime scope object. But that's this really kind of sideways angle that you get on interacting with scopes. So the answer here is that there is nothing you could return such that the person calling any scope has a reference to the scope. Are there any questions about that? Uh, I put an asterisk here because there's one exception to this rule. And it's most useful if you can believe that there's a complete difference in these two universes where scopes and, 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 and objects are, have no overlap. Unfortunately, there's a tiny overlap. 
There is an object that represents the global scope. It's only one of many scopes. But it's one object, it's one scope that has a corresponding object. The global object has properties on it with the same keys as the variables that are available within the global scope. So to talk about the global object dot foo is the same as to interact with the variable foo if the variable foo lives in the global scope. So the rules we're about to learn about scopes only pertain to scopes. The rules we just learned about objects only pertain to objects. The one exception is you get this special thing that can kind of be both at once. Try to ignore the existence of the global object for now, because it can only confuse matters. I say it now so that if you are familiar with it, you're not sort of like working to reconcile this lie I just told you, that there's zero overlap. There's a tiny bit of overlap that I want to set aside for now. Uh, scope nesting. It's possible to build a scope inside a scope, and when you talk about a variable in the inner scope, if it is not available, if you, if you, for example, if these, if this green area maps to a, a section of my code that is inside another scope section, then from within the innermost area, if I'm talking about name, it will fall through and look up name here. So I can talk about the name variable in the outer scope as well as the inner scope. Assuming the inner scope is inside the outer scope. So that's fall through, we'll see that take place. And then, it's the case that you can have many sort of, you can create an arbitrary nested tree structure of scopes. Uh, inner variables mask outer variables that share a name. So here we have the variable name is Charlie in the global scope, and inside the variable name is Alice in this blue scope. If I'm inside this blue scope and I try to talk about name, I don't have any way of talking about the outer global name. As soon as I type the word name, the identifier, it thinks I'm talking about the local one. So that is masking. Lastly, and this is the most important part of the scopes section, scopes are created every time you call a function. Exactly as many times as you call a function. When, and I'm talking specifically about the scope objects. A scope is not created once per function definition. That would be lexical scope. That would be the scopes that you can see when you read your code. A brand new scope is created every time you call a function. So, how much, how many scopes would you expect there to be in the sort of gray shirt? Yeah. Uh, how many scopes would you expect this code to have in it if I ran this, this whole thing? You there. In the back. Nope, behind you. Seven scopes, yes. Because we've called the, this function three times, we've called this function three times, and every, every program starts with a global scope. What we, would, what we would not say is the case is that there are two scopes or three scopes. There isn't a scope for this function and a scope for that function. That would be the other definition that we started with, the one where we said sometimes people using the word scope mean the region of your code that you can type within that has distinct access rules from... Excuse me. Can I get a water? I'm talking a long time. Uh, we would not be talking about uh, the regions of our code that have different access rights. We're talking about the fact that when we call the, the sum function the first time, 2 and 2 were given names, A and B. And so we ran this function in a, in a given scope. Thank you so much. And, uh, and then we ran it again. 
we wanted the second run of the function to talk about a very different A and a very different B from the first run. And so a brand new scope was created where those names meant different things. This is a very important distinction. The second time the sum function runs, these names must have different meanings. And so we have to build a brand new scope object for that second run of the function. There are as many scope objects as there are invocations of a function. When do scopes get destroyed? JavaScript is a memory managed language, meaning you don't have to worry yourself very much or ever about garbage collection, which is nice, uh, but it kind of obscures the answer to your question. Yes, they do get collected eventually. The way that that happens is internally JavaScript is keeping track of uh, what variables you could possibly talk about in your program. And if you can't possibly talk about a variable any longer, then it garbage collects that scope. It garbage collects that variable. So let's, let's write a quick program that exemplifies how scopes come into existence as objects distinct from scope regions in our code. We're going to write a story generating program that writes stories in the classic Hollywood tradition, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl. So here I've written my program. Uh, you don't have to read it because we're gonna, go, we're gonna go through it line by line. We're gonna examine what happens in the runtime, in memory, as these lines of code are being evaluated. And Quinn, if you can get this running on your machine, uh, we can demo it. Uh, uh, we've written a tool, uh, Quinn was one of the uh, primary developers that uh, helped write a tool that renders this stuff automatically, uh, but we'll look at it in my slides first. Uh, the coloring here is to indicate what scope region on the, in, in uh, the textual layout each, each region has its own color. So the outer purple part is global, and then inside the story function, you have this blue area, the win and fail functions get their own color. That's the lexical scoping use of the word scope. Each color is a different lexical scope. What we're gonna do is run the code, and as the code is running, we're gonna build up the in-memory dynamic scope object. So when the program starts running, it just builds a global scope before any line of code runs at all. And this red dot is your interpreter. Your interpreter looks up variables from some context, depending on where you're currently, what you're currently executing. So the, so the red dot currently has access only to variables defined in the global scope. Since we haven't run any lines of code yet, there are no variables in the global scope. No. <laughs> okay. Hang on. So, we run the first line of code, and we're not going to examine how the random hero function works. We're just going to assume that the browser gave us this function that generates a random, heroic-sounding string. 
So over here, some things are going to change in my in-memory layout. What would you expect to change if you were giving this presentation? How would you update the picture of the world as a result of this line of code having run? Probably got a new variable in it for, for the hero you generated. Exactly. So it's going to it's going to be a, a variable named hero, and it will map to some heroic sounding string. Girl, in this case. And then we're going to run the next line. What is the next line of code in the black? Declares a function in the global scope. Yes, the next line of code spans from here all the way down to here. And this stuff in between is kind of ignored. That code doesn't run. But this joint line of code builds a function object. That's this value here, starting with the F and ending with the curly brace and stores it in a brand new variable, story. So it's pretty similar to the line before it. The value stored here is some function object. And now we're ready to run the story function. And only then will we jump up into the body of that function. So when you run a function, a new scope object is created. I'm creating a blue scope here that relates to the blue section inside the story code. The interpreter moves in there and starts doing variable lookup from within that scope object. I'm going to dim out this box here and move the focal line of code to the first line of story. The next thing that's going to happen is very much like what happened in the global scope. We're going to create a new variable target. It's going to get a random target assigned to it. In this case, CEO. So the story is going to be about a girl and a CEO. The CEO string is stored in a variable that is local to the scope and not in the global scope. We then create a win function and a fail function, and we call all three of them, we call both of them, three times. So first we call the win function. That creates a win scope inside the story scope. The interpreter moves in, and we run the first line. First line creates a local variable, and then we do variable lookup. The process by which we look up each of these three variables, it's going to be slightly different, right? The first one, hero, well that's all the way out in the global scope, right? So it falls through out of the green scope, out of the blue story scope, and all the way up to global. But then action is found locally and satisfied and CEO has to fall out once go. And so this output array that we're building here is going to include, and this is just like a picture of what your console will have in it, the gray area down here. It's going to include girl trump CEO as the first, as the first string. The interpreter moves out because we're done running the win function, and at this point, it's impossible to imagine getting access to the value trumps, right? You cannot posit that the interpreter can trust that no future code could possibly talk about the value trumps. There's no way that future code has typed anything that could mean give me access to whatever the action variable stores. And I would propose that you can't imagine code that should mean that. So since the interpreter has detected that no future code could possibly run that could be talking about the variable action, it garbage collects that variable and the scope that it's in. You may think, well, we could get access to the action variable again, right? How could we do that? It, it seems as though we could do that. How, how does it seem as though we could do that? What do you think? Doesn't it seem like we should be able to get access to action again 
sorry, this action, the one in win. So we ran win, we garbage collected it. It feels like we should maybe be able to get access to action again, perhaps just by running win a second time. Right? That would be a new action. It would be a new action. That is the thing that I want you not to get tripped up by. When you run a function a second time, you're generating a new scope because you want a whole new environment to run that function in. Functions, by nature, right, are supposed to be able to run in isolation. They're supposed to be independent of all the other times that that function is run and all the other code that isn't that function. You want to trust that a function will operate as if it's the first and last time it's ever operated. That's how functions are so magically uh, simple to think about. You don't have to remember the history of how that function ran in the past. It's kind of like a uh, uh, the difference between a a blender. The blender operates the same no matter how many times you run the blender, which is different from like a switchboard, right? As you, as you connect things in a switchboard, you would better understand the new configuration of the switchboard. It's going to operate all differently. Or a president, president of the country, has to operate in a brand new environment that is based on a long history of stuff. The president has to consider, in order to be a good president, they have to consider a lot of context. It's very difficult to be a president. It's very easy to be a blender. So, the second time we run win, we're going to get a different scope. If we run the fail function, we get a unique, fun, a unique scope for fail. We run a random failure, we get injures. We do variable lookup on hero, action, and target. And it, girl, it gets girl, injures, CEO. Girl, injures, CEO. And then we run the win function a second time, creating a brand new scope. And that's why we get a brand new value. There is not just a new value assigned to the, the action variable. There is a brand new variable that has no relationship with the old variable in a brand new scope that has no relationship with the old scope. And when we're done doing all of our lookups, of course we can garbage collect. And at that point we're done running the whole function, so we can garbage collect that too. If we were to run the story function a second time, we would get a whole parallel fleet of values. Are there any questions about the diagram as we've seen it so far? All right. So once it gets purged, that's it. There's no all references and laws. Is you can't get the value back. So the question was once the scope has been garbage collected, or all of the variables in the scope has been, have been garbage collected, you can't get access to them anymore, right? And I would say that that is actually sort of a tautology, because my definition of garbage collection for JavaScript is the interpreter notices that you can't get access to things, because there's no way, there's no, there's no lexical way to have typed something that gives access. So the definition of garbage collection to me entails you having lost access. You've lexically lost access. The rest of your code couldn't express the idea of accessing those variables, those values. And so the garbage collector is just kind of doing the naturally implied thing by, by cleaning up the memory that you don't have any way lexically of, of talking about it anymore. Does that make sense? Uh, cool. If you're ready, if you feel as though that stuff made a lot of sense, and I'm, I'm willing to take one more question on this so that we're standing on a good foundation, we can talk about closures. They are very confusing. So are there any questions you, you guys want to ask before we do that? Cool. I have to revert to my actual version of this slideshow. Thank <laughs> you.
target in the global scope, and then I put win in the global scope as well, then even if I run win inside the story function. Uh, I'm just noticing that the amount of code necessary to understand your yeah. question is high enough that once I do understand it, uh, it would take some work to explain it. But if you type your code out, uh, I will either explain it in person or flash it up if I can, if it seems like something that everybody's going to learn from. Okay. Uh, but yeah, definitely type that out, and uh, I'd love to explore. Yeah. All right, closures. I'm not going to give you the definition of a closure right now because it's kind of misleading and confusing and difficult to wrap your mind around. Instead, I want to lead you to inventing closures yourself. They are a pretty reasonable in, uh, addition to a language that has function options. Once you have the idea of functions being passed around your system, you would probably ask yourself the questions we're about to ask eventually. So let's just do that. I've got a variable here, it's an array. I'm going to store stuff in it, don't worry about it. I've got an outer function that I'm going to run. So this code is the continuation of that code. Do -do 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 -do, and then it runs up here, okay? Column two. So this outer function, I run it immediately. And whatever happens in here, is what I'm going to do. Inside that function, I'm going to push new functions into this array. So basically what I'm doing is the weird little uh, backflip, little JavaScript backflip we're doing, is creating a scope that is within another scope, right? So, well, I'm not creating the dynamic scope, I'm creating a lexical scope. But I'm creating this lexical scope inside this other lexical scope and then I'm running outer which has the effect of generating a brand new function. So I run outer and I add a brand new function to this inner thing. Does the code make sense? Notice that this function is going to be around even after outer is done. So I could call inners sub zero. Right? Inner sub zero is the first element in the inners array, which is a function. These two parens invoke that function. So by calling outer, I generate a brand new function, I put it in the array, and then I invoke that function that was created. What will happen right now? Kind of nothing, right? Because there's no code in here. There's no code inside the inners function. So let's, let's make some variables to make this interesting. We've got a global variable A. We've got a very inner variable that's inner to this inner function C. And we have one in between from outer. And these three variables feel rather different to me. One is clearly going to be available to everybody. That's A. A just changes over time. It's a global variable. It's intuitive to everyone here, right? And C is rather intuitive to everyone here. When we run inners sub zero, we get a brand new C, right? If we run it seven times, we get a brand new C every, each of those seven times. But B is kind of in limbo. Is B like a global variable that's accessible later? Or is B like a local variable inside a function? And that's the, that's the question that you have to answer as a language designer when you invent closures. If I were to log A, B, and C as part of how this function operates, what would the user expect to see? So, before we reveal the answer, I'd like to examine your intuitions. As I recall, you have experience in other languages, and JavaScript is a little bit newer. And so I think you'd be a great person to ask. What are your expectations? Am I wrong? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are your expectations as to what this should log here? Uh, I think my expectation is going to be... Just, just the A part. Undefined. So A was defined on the second line of our program to be zero. 
So it spent very little time in, in an undefined state. Okay. And nothing ever changed A to be undefined. So unless there was A was referring to some local variable, A wouldn't be undefined. Notice we have scope fall through, falls through out of this function, out of that function, all the way to global. A is zero. A should be zero. B is zero. C is zero. Okay. All of them can be zero. Because we've never changed them. They're going to be set to zero, of course. Yep? By the time you call inners, why is B still around? Yeah. Great question. Great question. Uh, because this inner function needs the ability to talk about all the variables that are lexically available to it. Fall through says that if this function can run, it can talk about A in the global scope, it can talk about C in the global scope. And it can talk about B, because B is like lexically available to it, right? So this would make this would be very easy to understand if we were just calling this function the line after it was created, while the outer function was still running. What makes this really interesting is that we're running the inner function after the outer function has finished running. And the question we have to answer is, as a language designer, what do we make B talk about when we run a, when we run a function after, after its context has completed running? The answer that JavaScript gave was that, that graph that I showed you, we don't garbage collect variables as long as functions can still talk about them. That's the answer. If I were to put plus plus in front of each of these variable names, then you probably expect that they would have incremented to one, right? By the time we log them. Each of them was zero, and now they're all one. Pretty straightforward. But what happens when we run it a second time? And I'd love to come back to you, because I didn't give you a chance to really talk about your expectations. And I think your expectations are going to be super interesting here. A, the global variable A started out as zero, and then we ran inners, and it incremented A and logged it, right? So it made it one. Now we're running inners again. What is A going to be? Well, notice we have this plus plus here, and it's a global variable, so its state was probably lingering. Two. Okay. Now what about C? What would we expect C to be here? One. We would expect C to be 1 because it's a brand new variable C that gets generated, and it starts out as 0, and then it gets incremented to 1. And now my question is, what is B more like, A or C? How, will, how do we expect B to behave? Similar to A, which was 2, but still, but only the value 1? Yeah, I'm just saying it's on the outer, so I'm talking about like that. So I'd say 1. So you think it's 1 because it's similar to how C behaves? <coughs> it's created afresh? We're, we're calling it <coughs> multiple, not from the looks of this function. I would say, yeah, that's 1. Because well, check this out. Inners, we're calling inners a second time. Right, so the thing that is incremented is anything that enters is, has lasting effects on it. The things that are still one are the things that are being generated right now as a result of calling enters. The things that are changed by having called enters. So C is a brand new C, that's why it's one. B is not a brand new B. I can tell because outer has run only one time ever in history, right there. Much like A, which was a global variable, there's only one, there's only one B in existence, right? <coughs> we call outer one time, creating one scope that stored the, the, the variable B. So there's a one B variable in the whole program right now. This is closure. The lingering of this variable 
not the lexical variable you're reading on the screen, but the dynamic variable that got created in that data store when we called outer right there. The whole scope for outer got created, and it stayed in existence while we, while we ran inners a first and a second time. It's the same B variable, which is why it's changing, just like the global variable. All right, let's do a thumbs check. A thumbs check is an exercise that we do at school so that I understand how clear a concept has been. What I would like you to do is report to me using your thumb. Thumbs up means very positive, thumbs down means very negative. Report to me your level of confidence that you could explain closures clearly to a layman. Uh, they don't have to understand it, but you have to trust that you said it right. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence that you could correctly state what a closure is, such that I wouldn't nitpick some hugely wrong aspect of what you said. Thumb in the middle means, I don't know, kind of. Thumbs down means, no way, bro. Thumbs up, of course, I knew closures when I came in. Can we use slides? <laughs> no slides. Uh, all right, mostly thumbs middle. This is great. This means we need, to, we need to drill into this. Someone who had their thumbs middle, in fact, everyone who had their thumbs middle, take a moment to take the confusion you had, the sense of like, oh, I feel like I would fail at, and then take that blank and just say it out loud. Turn it into a question. In your mind, I need you to formulate that into a question for me. Yep. So, I understand that for B, but if I try to take the, those same words and apply them to, okay, so then how come C doesn't stick around? Because um, I can see the layperson trying to put both of the arguments saying, well, inners is a variable, inners has something that's for a slot, it's that function. And so that's kind of, so that's where the layperson would be looking for the argument. That's what I don't understand. Great. So, the, the, uh, the question boiled down to, if we use the sentence I said, which was, the language keeps variables around for as long as there are functions in existence that could talk about those variables. That's the sentence. I'll say it one more time. The language keeps variables around for as long as there are functions in existence that could talk about those variables. There might be a shorter way to say it, I hope, but I, I want to examine it. Uh, I'll come right back to you. Is it about that sentence? Well, well, okay, go for it. Well, so maybe it's just a, a, to me it's a confusion between closure and scope because what you're describing to me sounds like scope. Ah, right. And this is pretty close to the question she's asking as well. So, given the sentence that the language will not clear up variables as long as there are functions that can talk about those variables in existence, we could accidentally interpret that to do with like lexical scopes. So the, this function here has access, obviously, to its own scope, the function body associated with it, in a lexical sense. If I was looking at this and not running the code, I see this as, as one function, right? But this is not one function. This is as many functions as we create by calling outer. A brand new function comes into existence every time we run outer. These are two different definitions of the word function, two different definitions of the word variable. There are as many B variables at runtime as I have run the outer function. At, fu at program definition time, however, there is only one B variable, right? We are saying something rather different when we talk about the B variable at program definition time versus one of the many B variables that come into existence at runtime. Sure, if I may just put a, put a punctuation at the end of that that tries to answer the question. Uh, the sentence, the language won't garbage collect a variable, by which I mean a runtime variable, until there are no functions in existence, by which I mean 
runtime function objects that can talk about that variable. It's very important that we know I'm talking about runtime functions and runtime variables. But when I run outer a second time, I could certainly create a brand new function that has access to a new B. When I run inners a second time, I create a new C. There are going to be a multiplicity of C variables. Each one is garbage collected immediately as soon as the inners zero function finishes running. So now, so what you're describing in my head makes total sense. I'm trying to determine exactly what a closure represents. It sounds like it's an executable block, like what you were showing in your previous slide, the execution block that I think of as scope, I think of what you're referring to as a closure. No, uh, a closure, there's a definition coming right up here. Uh, a closure is a function that has access to variables of functions that have finished <laughs> A function object, not a, not a, not a lexical function. Like, right. the word F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N ending the curly brace here is a visible piece of code function. I mean the runtime function object, if it retains access to variables of functions that have stopped, that have, that have already returned, then, uh, then it's a closure. Cool. All right. <laughs> So we're going to explore this in more detail, but I would like to I would like to make sure that the definitions we've given for closures so far make sense, and that we have an opportunity to really stand on solid ground with that stuff. So all of you thumbs middle folks and thumbs down folks, can you put your curiosity or confusion into the form of a question? Yeah, you're saying, why is it the case that closure is a useful thing to have built into the language at all? So, I can give you a general answer, and I can give you a specific example. I want to start with the example because I think it will connect more, but then I'm going to generalize it to, the, to all cases. The specific example is, if you have, if you want to register an on-click handler in your browser application, and you do so inside a subroutine of a subroutine of a subroutine. Yeah? That sub sub subroutine that has lexically, it talks about variables all the way out to global, right? It talks about local variables, but it also talks about ones in the scope right around it and right around it. You're registering a click handler that's going to happen some point long after this whole block of nested code has completed, right? The code runs, the, the handler gets registered, and then time progresses. And the user clicks a thing, the click handler fires, and the question is, how is the code inside that click handler supposed to behave? It talks about variables not just local to itself, and not just global, but including variables from the scopes in between. So since we know for sure that the user is going to click long after the code is run that registered the click handler, asynchronously in fact, after all of those functions have, have returned, we must answer the question, how does this click handler treat the variables it refers to from functions that have returned? Does that seem like a, a reasonable use case, or does it not quite answer your question? I'm sorry. Apologies. I can come back to you if you... <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'll, let me give you the general case uh, answer, and then we can connect it to the on-click, uh, and, and you tell me whether there's room for uh, more clarity. The general case is, is actually on the screen already. Anytime a function, anytime we are going to retain access to a function after its containing context has finished running, we have to answer the question, what do we do when it tries to talk about variables from its containing context? So in the on-click example, the click handling function was much like this, nested inside a function that had been called, and some things happened that let you had a boot function, the boot has like a, a, a setup subroutine, and the setup subroutine has to run 
uh, you know, twice for some reason, and you call it twice, and then it calls some stuff, and you've got all of these variables, and then inside the subroutine of the setup, you've got the, the click handler being attached to the logout button. It talks about something from setup, it talks about something from the boot, and it talks about something from global. Those functions have finished running. Someone clicks logout, they're talking about the function that got registered at that time. It has references to variables from functions that have completed. So the language says, you know what? We're going to leave those in existence. We're going to let them evolve over time, just like global variables do. So when you run this, and uh, you run outer for the second time, and you run inner again. Uh, we're actually going to do an example where we run outer a second time. So uh, it's difficult for people to track on code that isn't on the screen. So since I already have that one, I'd like to wait till we get there. But by all means, do, do ask this question when we've got it on the screen. And also, I think I feel like we had one that I was supposed to answer for you later. Did that ever get up? Yeah, the object uh, calling object. Ah! All right. As soon as we break, I want to answer objects with objects inside. Yes? So in this example, inners is the closure. Inners is the closure function, yes. It's said to close, it's said to have closure scope access to variables from outer. Could you kind of repeat what it does mean the closure? Because I'm trying to describe, is it the code of the function that you're talking about, or is it like a runtime instance of the code of the function? Uh, the way most people are going to use it, it is the instance of a function, the inner function, that has access to outer, to variables from an outer scope. Now, looking at this code, I could read it and interpret the fact that this, this inner function will be a closure whenever it's created, the many times that it becomes created and it will create many closure instances. Looking at it, I might call it a closure. That would be a different use of the word. For all code constructs, there's like a, 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 a parse time definition of every construct and a runtime definition of every construct. But generally when we say closure, we're talking about a runtime. All it has closure as well, right? Now it won't because it says access to the global variables. Uh, great question. Does outer have closure scope access to the global variables? Generally, we don't use the word closure to refer to a function that has access to global variables because global variables are kind of accessible through even without the mechanism, even without the mechanism of closure. It looks so similar that I, I don't take issue with your calling it that, but no one does call it that. Um, as an example of why that's not the case, you could have two different files. In Node, you, there is a global object that you can hack, and two different files will have access to two global, global objects, even though lexically they do not have closure access to those global variables. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I was right here in the middle, right? Inching my way up. Because <laughs> in my mind, What's missing is the clarification the between what's a closure and what's a, uh, what's a scope. And in Enclosure, mind, look, there are two ways you could say that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I feel like I know what your, your, okay. your question is, is there a, how can I discern the difference between a closure and a scope? Um, some people use the word closure a little differently than the way that I have, and it means the same thing. It's just they're talking about a different noun in this whole you know, population of nouns I've used, okay? You've got the definition I gave. A closure is a function that retains access to variables from other functions that have finished running, right? But another way you could say it that might be that certainly talks about the same thing, even if it isn't technically accurate. Uh, you could say that a closure is a scope that remains in existence after its associated function has completed running. In this case, someone would someone would use the word a bit differently to say that. The outer function has a closure, which is its scope, which is still available because the inner's function has access to it. These are two sides of the same point. The function, uh, this, this inner function here, that we retain access to, and the scope that it retains access to as a result, are two sides of the same kind of like idiosyncrasy we're examining. So it wouldn't be insane to call the closure, the scope itself, a closure scope. But I believe the technically most correct definition, and I could be mistaken about this, is that the closure is the function itself that is resulting in retained access. It, it, is it accurate to say that the scope 
Uh, if you accept the other definition that I'm claiming, based on my research, is the slightly less technically correct definition. You could say that, if, if you use this other definition, you could say that a closure is a scope that just doesn't get garbage collected after its function has finished running. And that might even be clearer for some people, which is why I don't mind giving this potentially inaccurate definition. But the definition that I, be that, that I believe uh, is the most correct at this point, unless there's a functional programming expert who can correct me, which I would welcome, I believe the more correct definition is that the function that retains access to that scope is the closure. That's the thing that we're referring to with the noun closure. So if inners was not logging B, it would not be a closure? That's correct. If inners did not log B, it would not be a closure function because uh, it doesn't have access to, so, and therefore the outer scope would be garbage collected because the okay. interpreter could detect that there's no way to talk about B anymore. Does it change anything if you pass B as a parameter to the function? Does it change anything? So you find inners dot push function? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. And I posted Pat, this is a great question. Does it map? Does it change matters? Does it change matters if B were an input to the outer function rather than a local variable? I coasted past this in the, in the earlier discussion. I sort of had that, that, that uh, slide where uh, an input variable and there was an arrow and it became a, a local variable and I said a local variable is very similar to a function input. They are, it, it, an argument to a function, an input to a function is by all rights a local variable. So there would be no difference if this was a, if B was something you passed into outer. It would still be a variable that was local to outer that you had closure scope access to with your inner function. I was actually referring to passing it to the inner function. So you define B and outer, inner stop push function, parent B. Would that pass it as a copy of the value and then remove the reference in the outer? If, uh, so the question was, if we hacked this code a little bit, so that instead of this, we had B. Well, you had it before. You defined B in the outer, right there. Uh, this is, we're, we're, we're nearing a conceptual mistake that, that, that will reveal itself in the question. I mean, that an answer is not necessary, but we'll, we'll, we'll provide one anyway. Okay. What could this possibly mean? Why are we keeping this line of code around? Right? Clearly, we have to pass something in here. Right, because inners, this is inners, uh, sub zero. Right. Yeah. So we have to pass a value in that we're giving the name B. But we might as well give it the name X, because it, it has no relationship with this. You are you were for a moment, I believe, imagining that by naming B in the parameter list, we somehow are passing B into this function. But no passage is happening. At best, masking is happening. A brand new variable that is even tighter scope is masking our visibility into B. That is a really great observation. I wonder if anybody has questions about what we just sort of realized there. You can actually pass params at the end of your anonymous function and pass B. That's another great version of it. What if instead, here, we passed in B? Right. Like that? Yeah. Now, what is inners going to store? What you who proposed it, what would you suspect inners, the array, is going to have in it? It's going to have zero. What's that? Sorry, what's your question? So the inners array, right here, inners is created, it's an array. We then have an outer function that mutates it, and right here, we call outer. So when we call outer, inners is pushed, all of this stuff. What is inners going to store? It'll have one element in it. What is it? Uh, it's going to have C. That's it. Well, C is a variable that can't be stored in an array. We can store values in an array. We cannot store variables in an array. So do you mean it'll store the same value as what C referred to? Yeah. Okay, what value did C refer to? Zero. Zero. Where... Where did, how would C get into inners? So, th in this world, inners stored a function, right? Inners was being pushed this function object. It stored a string. 
function is just a string. Function, no, no, function isn't a string. When you see F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N, paren, blah, 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 and curly brace, that creates an object. Just like two brackets creates an array object. It's actually just a string until you call inner zero with the paren. So if you just call inner zero without the paren, you just get the function string. Uh, it's, it is not technically a string. It gets rendered in the console to look similar to a string, yeah, but it's a function object that can store properties. Regardless, at this moment, inners, in this version of the code, prior to the recommendation that we pass B in, in this version of the code, inners stores one, one element, which is a function object. If we were to put, you know, if we were to pass some value here, what do you think inners will store? This is the crazy thing. It will return whatever the, it will store, inners would store whatever the function returns. Because, undefined. Because this whole function, if we invoke it immediately, we lose access to the function itself. That function's gone. We get access to what that function evaluates to. Since there's no return value, inners now stores undefined, and this generates an error. So again, we have another attempt, valid attempt, I warred with this stuff when I was first learning JavaScript. Like, there's gotta be a way. No, we have another valid attempt, that, but but that ultimately doesn't work to circumvent the rule or the 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 observation that B is a closure scope variable. Giving it a name here doesn't do anything. Calling it here does even worse stuff. The only meaningful interpretation of this code is one where B is a closure scope variable. That's it. Okay. Yeah. How does the interpreter know that it needs to keep B around? How? Great question. How does the interpreter know to keep B around? The interpreter has very cleverly implemented uh, tracking <coughs> that watches every one of your functions and notices when you when you lose all references to a function, if I lose, if I push, if I pop off of inner, right here on this next line, I say inners dot pop. On the next line, the interpreter could detect that there are no, excuse me, there are no more references to this function, because there was only one to begin with. And that this function was the only thing, it's also keeping track of what variable, who has an idea, who has references, who's talking about B. Well, this function that used to exist was talking about B, but I popped it and it went into the ether and I didn't store it in the variable. So the, the interpreter does reference counting and says, hey, there's zero references left for B. I'm going to garbage collect it. Any other questions about closures? Because I got more slides, so it's cool. We're going to call outer again. And your question was what about that? So you call outer run this uh, the function, you initialize it in B again. Ah, interesting. Okay, so let's examine this. What do you expect this to log in this case? Notice we ran outer again, which had the effect of adding a brand new function to the inners array, but we're still running the original one. Three for global. Is global. That's right. The next one should actually be zero, right? Because you're running out of the first line. But instead, you get three, three, one. So the first one we expect is three for sure, because it's global and it's of course going to be mutated. The last one is C. Of course, that's going to be one. But notice we are still running inners sub zero. It's the original inners function that has access to the same scope as these did. A new scope was created for the second run of outer, but that new scope is available to a different function. Inners bracket 1 has access to the brand new scope, where b is equal to 0.
When I said that a brand new scope is created every time you call a function, that's what I meant. I meant that this first run of outer created a, the first and only B, which was available to this function that was stored in inner zero. And then we ran outer again, creating a second B that is in a second scope. That second scope is available to the second version of inner, stored in inners one. Super confusing. <laughs> I think it might be time. Is Quinn still here? Yes. Are you going to show inners one? Why, yes, I am. Uh, Quinn. Do you think you could try to get this code running that's up here in Visual Interpreter? Because I think it'll help them to see it step through. Yep, and I just got to have it literally run into the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like we have five minutes. What time is it? 12.54. 12.54. Is that lunch? Well, apparently you're the only one running, running on time at the moment. So. I'm the only one running on time. <laughs> now to talk about how the other yeah, is. Well, let's see if we can keep it that way. What I'll do is, uh, I will, I will not stop talking because I think that, because I just can't. I just, I'm not, as a person, I'm not a man. <laughs> I'll keep talking about the demo that that, that Quinn and I are going to do. Uh, but I'll invite you guys to switch to the work that you have and, and have the uh, the TAs walking around, and uh, you know I'll just. Speak loud enough that the people in the front here can hear me, but I'll, I'll, I'll take off the microphone. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing it play out blow by blow, then we'll do that. But before we do, we have five minutes to discuss the, um, the nature of running inners sub one. Inners sub one is the brand new function that was created here. It's the one that has access to a brand new B. So my first question, all the way in the back, what would you expect the A, the log of A, to yield when we're running inners 1? 4. Yes. What would you expect the log of C to be? 1. 1. What would you expect the log of B? 1. Exactly. The brand new scope created this second time was only available to inners 1. It was not available to inner zero, which is why inner zero continued to use the old one. When I said, when I showed you the picture of the data store, and I and I started teasing out the difference between a lexical scope and a dynamically generated in-memory scope object, it maybe felt a little pedantic and academic, right? This is why it's so important. You can't reason about how your code will run if you aren't building in your mind a separate little object, a separate data store where different sets of data are being held. Does that make sense? Are there any more questions about closures before we move on? This one's interesting before we leave. If I run inners 0 again after having run inners 1, what would you right there with the hat? Yes. What would you expect it to log A, B, and C? Running inners 0 yet again after these lines of code above. A would be 5, C would be 1, and P would be 4. You got it. B would be 4 because we're talking about the scope that this one was talking about, and this B scope is incrementing by 1. Unaffected by the second scope from outer that created a scope for inners 1. Okay, here's the definition. A function, a closure is a function that retains ongoing access to the variables of the scope that was created in, even after outer function calls have returned. If you want to write one thing down, that's a good thing to write down. If you want to play with some code, up, oh, take a picture of the. If you want to play with some code in your console, this is good code to play with. You can sort of learn a bit about how closures work by playing with this code. There's also some closure exercises in the curriculum. So now, uh, 
I would like to, how do we do this? I want to make sure that people don't feel trapped. Could you do me a favor? Everybody stand up. <coughs> if you would like to start hacking on stuff and getting help from TAs and working on this stuff and typing this code in your browser, head toward the back. If you would like to talk about, if you'd like to see Visual Interpreter uh, uh, run through the previous example and draft these closure scope objects in real time, one line at a time, uh, come toward the front. That way we can sort of like segregate and, 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 and folks can get help back there without disturbing us up here. Uh, and just have a seat somewhere in the front two rows if you want to see this demo. Otherwise, head toward the back two rows with your laptop. 